she was born into polygamy. Her family followed the teachings of Joseph Smith, including plural marriage. Like many young girls, she had been promised to a man who was her father's age. But she ran away. She chose hell over a life of polygamy. That girl was me. I was lost, alone, desolate. Then Jesus Christ found me and rescued me. In his love, I found real freedom. He is a shield to all who will take refuge in him. This is why I can look back and ask, polygamy, what love is this? Welcome to Polygamy, What Love Is This? I'm your host, Doris Hansen. We talk about Mormon polygamy, presenting the question, if God really loved us, would he have required polygamy as Joseph Smith claimed he did? Before we get started on the, today's topic, I'd like to mention that if you or anyone that you know is in polygamy and you'd like to get out, you can contact a Shield and Refuge Ministry for help in escaping. The link is on the screen if you want to go to the website for information, or you can call our toll-free number 877-425-9993 and everything that discussed will be held in complete confidence. If you want to make any comments about any of our shows or ask questions or if you'd like to be a guest on our show, you can email us at email at whatloveisthis.tv or you can give us a call at 385-240-2888 and we'd love to hear from you. And now I'd like to introduce and welcome back again Earl Erskine. Hi, Doris. Hi. Glad again. to be here. <laughs> Glad to have you here and share in this sad but this very is a, interesting. This is a tough one. It's you know, hard. I just, I feel really, I hope people are paying attention to this kind of a message. I know some of them aren't as heavy as others. This one's a tough one. This you know. one's a bit heavy, yes. Yeah. During the 2008 raid on the FLDS compound in El Dorado, Texas, the Department of Family and Protective Services in Texas discovered that 12 girls between the ages of 12 and 15 had been sexually abused with the knowledge of their parents and had been spiritually married to older men within the polygamy group. And of those 12 girls, seven of them had one or more children. Now, we want to share one of many responses from concerned citizens about this after hearing the news reports of these abuses on children in the FLDS. Yeah, it reads, the men as well as the adult women should all be arrested for rape and sexual assault. I don't care what your religious beliefs are. If you allow your daughters to be spiritually married to a man four times her age when she's 14, you're just as guilty as the man who's raping her. I'm really tired of religion being used as a tool to justify abuse in this country. Good that response. Is, uh, yeah. Now, keeping this in mind, we're going to move over to a topic and time together in a minute. The Salt Lake Tribune recently reported that youth suicide rate in Utah has nearly tripled since 2007 and is now the leading cause of death among 10 to 17 year old teens in Utah. Utah Mormonism and polygamy contributes to that problem. Sexual abuse by parents or allowed by parents suggests this may have much to do with why suicides in Utah have tripled during that time. Polygamy incubates sexual predators resulting in the abused then committing suicide. Often, not every time, of course. This happens perhaps more than any of us would like to imagine, however. I personally know of many suicides of teens in polygamy groups just in the last few years. Some suicides happen because hope is gone. There's no hope for a better life. There's no hope for understanding, no hope to escape from the religious dogma and, and of polygamy. And if they do get out, there is a deep fear that the polygamous God will relentlessly terrorize them for daring to leave. And then, of course, the painful shunning by their families. Some suicides are because of sexual abuse from which they see no escape. 
Some are because the Mormon culture demands such perfection and heaps upon their teenagers so much guilt when they cannot measure up to the perfection their parents and their religion choirs and expects. There is a Mormon saying that goes like this. Yeah, I've heard this many times. The celestial kingdom is so great or wonderful that if you were able to see it, you'd kill yourself just to get there. I heard that a lot yeah. myself. And they say this isn't Mormon doctrine, and it probably isn't, but it is repeated over and over again generationally. Yeah. We heard this growing up. We wonder with statements like this why Utah has such a high incident of suicide. We can't blame it on the altitude. <laughs> These suicidal teenagers need hope, and the religion of this culture gives them no real-time, tangible hope. Instead, they repeatedly put them on guilt trips, which causes their downward spiral, which too often ends in suicide. They say things like, you need to make Father in Heaven happy, uh, or Heavenly Father happy, excuse me, by doing what we say He wants you to do. Do it even if it makes you unhappy. So grin and bear it. Fake it till you make it. Well, they know that that's a lie. They know that they're living it. They know that, uh, they, that what they need to know is the truth yeah. that God is happy when we trust in Jesus alone, not in religion or rigid self-righteousness or by personal performance. They need to know their hope is living fearlessly under God's grace and mercy, which he gives abundantly. We quote from 1 John. Yeah, this is wonderful. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lo lives in love lives in God and God in him. Suicide doesn't come from that kind no, of belief. No. The guilt trips from the Mormon and polygamous religions bring fear and hopelessness, but God brings love and hope, and his love does not produce fear or depression or command polygamy. Another verse from yeah, 1 John. From a couple of verses later, it says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. And if all of Mormonism, including yeah. the polygamists, would throw out their unbiblical <laughs> doctrines of works for salvation, striving to be people pleasers instead of pleasing God, there would be a change in our teens. They would have hope because God gives great hope to all who will accept his grace alone through faith alone for eternal life. Now, we're talking about Mormon Utah, yeah. the very people who claim to be God's exclusive and holy people, but look at the fruit of their religion, Utah teen suicides soar to new heights. Now, it's normal in polygamy groups that girls are forced into marriages. Everybody yeah. knows that, and often underage marriages, and many children are regularly exposed to other harms. We wonder how can a parent whose role is supposed to be protector fail to protect their children from sexual predators? Polygamy is about rape, child brides, and forced marriages. Most mothers and fathers know this. It's no longer a secret even to the general public. But should they be charged as accessories to the crimes against their children? And should they be held responsible for failure to protect, for failure to take aggressive action against those who harm their children? People ask, how can a mother just stand by and say nothing when her child is being abused? How can they want for their daughters what they themselves have been forced to suffer? Aren't parents programmed to protect their children? Isn't a mother's duty to protect her children? Should a mother who doesn't protect her children from harm be held accountable, maybe even face legal consequences? These are hard questions. Tragically, it is normal for polygamous mothers to help arrange illegal child marriages to much older men, some of them even preen with pride if her young daughter has been chosen to marry an important man of their community or the leader. Allowing assault by their silence is assault by permission because they have not protected their child. Society and government and parents all have the responsibility to protect those who can't protect themselves. And we should be diligent in making sure that those who abuse children pay for their crimes. 
but instead it seems that with polygamy groups a blind eye is turned not only from the abused but also from the abusers. Why aren't failure to protect laws enforced in polygamist environments? Actually, a polygamist wife who permits the abuser to continue to harm her children needs help herself. She needs help escaping, or at least help in recognizing abuse, and to help to recognize that failure to protect is wrong, even in God's eyes. Many polygamist women will not report abuses because she lives in daily fear herself or because she doesn't know how to protect without placing herself in personal danger. Many polygamous mothers don't see a way out. Where would she go with all these children? But there are outside resources, people who will help her escape into a safe place and who offer long-term assistance for her and for her children. In fact, a Shield and Refuge ministry does just that. All you have to do is call us. We not only help them escape, but and, 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 and we don't just drop them after we've helped them out uh, and expect them to fend for themselves. We offer long-term care and concern. The toll-free number for that kind of help is on the screen, 877-425-9993. But we also know that there are wives who do have the mental capability to recognize and report abuse and they do nothing to rescue their abused children because they think it's God's will. That's what they've been told. There are also mothers who place the full responsibility and blame on the daughter if she's been raped or sexually assaulted. One mother I know personally, when her daughter was raped by a brother, blamed the daughter and told her that she must have done something to cause him to do that to her. I recently read a book entitled The Sound of Gravel, written by Ruth Warner. She's from the LeBaron Polygamy Colony in Mexico, and she suffered through assault and sexual abuse by her polygamous stepfather, as did several of her half-sisters. And Ruth wrote this in her book. I never liked my stepfather and hated him after I turned eight. That's when he'd sneak into my bedroom during the nights he stayed with my oh during he sneak into my bedroom during the nights he stayed with my mom and touched me he promised me ice cream if i kept quiet but i told my mom multiple times what he was doing each time she told me he was sorry and that we needed to practice forgiveness it crushed my soul that my mother wouldn't leave him but in our religion women needed to be married to get into heaven so she stayed and we wonder about teen suicide. Yeah. Relative to our topics are some responses that her mother made with Ruth when Ruth told her that her stepfather was sexually assaulting her. And we want to quote from Ruth's young and tender mind as she suffered through this repeated abuse and her mother did nothing. We normally would put this on the screen, but we don't have this quote to go up on the screen. Yep. But Earl's going to read it anyway. I'm going to read it. And I began to take refuge in a world of fantasies. I imagine slicing my wrists, then watching my soul escape through my wounds, floating up to heaven as my arms are bathed in blood. A few months after that half-brother died, another of my father's children followed suit, hanging herself with her husband's belt. It came to seem that suicide run in my family, and by the time we were living in New Mexico, I became fixated on how I might be able to follow in my half-sibling's footsteps. I fantasized about slicing up my skin, cutting myself, and all the places where I'd been touched. I felt my skin had betrayed me. Something on it must have been different than in, that invited his touches, something that indicated I wanted to him. Regardless of whatever I said otherwise, I had goodness and virtue in me, but it was wrapped in the skin that was evil. Now this is thoughts of suicide uh, from the author of this book through her experience yeah. because she was assaulted and no one did anything to help her. There was no hope. There was no way of escape. Now this is not unusual in the dark closed society of Mormon polygamy groups and we wonder why there's so much suicide in Utah where there's so many polygamists and where the hopelessness of Mormon polygamy continues to abound. Ruth writes something that may help us understand how hopelessness and frustration enters into the young person's experience. Yeah. 
The afterlife, as had been explained to me in Sunday school and by my mother, was run by men who have been polygamous on earth. Women who had been faithful and loyal wives would become goddesses, heavenly servants to the man who ruled over them. What kind of eternal hope is that? Oh, a no, goddess who no is a servant <laughs> and a plural wife, and that's what you are for eternity. Of course, that's only Mormon fantasy. It's not reality. It has no biblical basis or truth at all, but they don't know that. As time went on, Ruth's stepmother did not stop, or stepfather did not stop molesting her, and she began to suspect that he was also molesting her half sisters, daughters from other mothers, and so she went to them and asked them. Like me, each had thought she was the only one who had been harmed, but unlike me, they had never told their mother. My stepsisters and I were afraid that our moms wouldn't believe us that we might be punished. Then again, it would be a lot harder for our mothers to doubt all three of us. So we vowed to go together to tell them the truth that night. And so the three girls yeah. went to their mothers and told them what had been going on, the sexual molestation by their stepfather. And this is what happened. Well, how come you girls haven't said anything before? He said that if we told anyone, Sally answered, it would make you mad and you feel bad. Are you sure you're not just saying this about him because you girls don't like him? When did all this happen? If this really did happen, why didn't you come to us with it sooner? He told us not to tell you because he said we would hurt your feelings, and we thought we would get into trouble and he'd whip us with his belt. We were embarrassed, and Sally added, we were afraid that you wouldn't believe us, but now there's three of us. Now, he had earlier in the story taken off his belt and whipped her mother in front of her. So she knew Aww. he was capable of whipping them with his belt. So the girls told the mothers, and then they waited in fear. How would their mothers respond to this information? Well, the mothers decided that they would go to that very night, even though he was with another wife that night, they were going to confront him about this and get it taken care of. We quote the results of the meeting. He said he was very sorry for what he did to you girls, and he even cried real hard when we talked about it. He promises he'll never do anything like that again. Promises, promises. And cried big tears, I'm sure. <laughs> Ruth's mother said that she thought he deserved another chance. She said he had problems, but God can help him get over them. She seemed perfectly willing to sacrifice her daughter for her husband, and she did. And Ruth's response was this. That morning I couldn't cry. I was beyond tears. Finally realizing that mom couldn't protect me from my stepfather made me feel so bad, made me feel too sad to cry. It was as though something in me just closed up. Apparently my mom could lie to her own daughter with as much ease and confidence that she had when she lied to the social workers and border patrolmen. The only difference was that this time it seemed as if she had actually convinced herself that she was telling the truth. So the, the feelings are just stymied, they're yeah. stuffed, they're, they're deadened. Too often mothers in polygamy groups are not only deceived by false doctrine of polygamy for salvation, they are also programmed to believe that they have less value than their male counterparts and their value is bound up completely in their willingness and success in serving these men and bearing a huge number of children. Instead of protecting her from her stepfather's abuse, Ruth's mother told her this. This is one of those times and we have to show God we have the power to forgive. Her sobbing increased until her words were almost unintelligible, just like Jesus taught us in the Bible. She shed many tears that day, but I don't think a single one of them was for me. Isn't Jesus told sad? us to forgive, but by golly, we can get away from our abusers in that forgiveness. Ruth writes about discovering after her mother died that her stepfather had also been sexually abusing her mentally challenged younger brother, Luke. It was at that point that Ruth decided she needed to take her siblings and get away from her stepfather before he began molesting the rest of her siblings. She took them and left the Liberan, Liberan 
colony. She was only 15 years old, and she moved in with her grandmother who lived in Southern California. Later, she discovered the list of children her stepfather had abused just kept getting longer and longer. We quote from page 355. The list of children he abused grew longer and longer over the years, and all of his wives eventually, finally, left him. <laughs> and if they had left earlier, how much abuse how much could have been avoided? Yeah. It seems like that Ruth, at 15 years old, took the responsibility and became the protector of her younger brothers and sisters, accomplishing what her own mother had failed to do. This is Mormon polygamy. Now, not all polygamists are in this category, obviously, but virtually everyone who escapes from a polygamy group or family tells of abuse or failure to protect by the adults in their lives. The Sound of Gravel was featured on the New York Post's website, and we quote, someone made a comment about her story. I love this. When you have to plot your escape... I'm pretty sure it's not a religion. <laughs> so why are these groups considered a religion? And they get the umbrella of religion yeah. because of that. Yeah. They get by with it. That's why they do it. Then they continue to get by with it. The they authorities do. know what's going on. Among polygamy groups, we find too many situations resulting in abject hopelessness among the teens. Girls as young as 13 are forced into marriages. Sexual abuse is rampant. Rape is covered up and child molesters are shielded by religious authorities. And in the FLDS, they are protected by law enforcement who are often polygamous sure. themselves. Sure. Boys are thrown out of town and abandoned. They are forcibly shunned away from their families just to reduce competition from the men for plural wives. And these are not only failure to protect, it is often the parents themselves who are doing these things on orders of the leadership yeah. and threats of ousting them if they don't obey. So group loyalty and fear of leadership is more important than the welfare of their children. Ruth Warner wrote in her book, The Sound of Gravel, and others have also told their stories, and hopefully more victims will come forward and gain the courage in spite of their fears uh, with their stories of abuse. Another one is by Sarah Hammond. She came from the FLDS, and she told about her father, who was a prominent religious leader with 19 wives. It's incomprehensible. <laughs> He, routine, he routinely molested her, even sliding his hand up her dress on his deathbed. We quote, The worst part of my childhood was the sexual abuse, she said. I was the victim of incest. As far as physical and sexual abuse, there were 12 perpetrators in my house. It's life-altering, damaging to the soul, and it's minimized. Twelve perpetrators. Brothers, Brothers mm -hmm. and her father. Father. Mm-hmm. And it's just like she was handed over to them, just, you know, like, yeah. a, like a piece of toast or something like that. It's, it's awful. In another interview about reporting this abuse to outside authority, Sarah said the following. Yeah. I never once considered going to the police, said Sarah Heyman, who told of enduring, enduring years of sexual abuse at the hands of her father and brothers. Going to the police would have been going against the whole town. Everyone was molesting. The church never said it was all right, but it was treated nonchalantly. So they knew it was going on, and everybody's nothing, doing it. Everybody's it sounds doing like it. it. Yeah, no. follow, yeah. So it, it wasn't unusual. I I just don't get that kind of mind think, but that's what they do. Yeah. In the FLDS, many men in the police department are polygamous. We talked about that, and it's against polygamy, still against the law. But state authorities have rarely acted to remove from law enforcement those who practice and, pro and protect polygamy and polygamous. Polygamy is a felony in Utah and a violation of both the Utah and the Arizona state constitutions. And when they take the oath of office to serve the public, they vow to obey the laws and uphold the Constitution. But why is everyone but polygamists held accountable for this? It almost always seemed like they were just uh, above the law or the law just turned a, turned a blind eye. 
it's to both. Yeah. It's, it's both. They do believe they're above the law, and the law does turn a blind eye. Yeah. How many years have, have well, we been have doing they, this? Have, they, have, have the authorities tried to go in and then failed because of some technicalities in the well, law or there's, something? There, no technicality. They're afraid of the religion thing. Yeah. Uh, 1953, they went in the FLDS and took the kids, much like they did in El Dorado, Texas in 2008. Yeah. And the public outcry was so great that they they uh, bend you know they bent over to the public pressure and, yeah. and sent the kids back. But the point, what they did is they sent the kids back to be abused <laughs> by the very things we've been talking about. Yeah. And, and so they didn't help the kids at all. They made it worse because then they dug in even deeper uh, into their secrecy. And it's funny because the Mormon church, of course, the mainstream Mormon church has that basic understanding that polygamy is their heritage. Mm -hmm. They certainly were part of Joseph Smith and Brigham Young and that we will eventually live polygamy again. Mm -hmm. So they've never really separated themselves from the whole concept of polygamy other than supposedly from 1890 to present they are not practicing it but it's right. still in the book. But it's still in the book, it's still Section a doctrine. Section 132 is still there. They, and, they still believe it and yeah. they want they want to be disconnected from it. Though We don't have anything to do with the groups they tell me. Some of them get angry. We don't yeah. have anything to do with it. Leave us out of it. You don't know doctrine if you think we do. But you know they're not living polygamy but it's still their doctrine. And to keep ignoring these stories is, is shocking. Oh, Please. so many of them come out, so many new stories, yeah. and they still, uh, the, the Cody Brown family is now headed to the Supreme Court because <laughs> they failed in Utah, they failed in the, uh, in the, their, um, no, the word escapes me now, uh, the appeal, and yeah. so now they're headed to the Supreme Court to, to get the, the polygamy legalized. Um, I guess our question is, you know, the teen suicides in Utah are so high. Uh, why aren't the polygamists held accountable to protect their own children? Yeah. If, if there would be a change in their religious dogma, then the drastic rise of seeing teen suicide would probably decrease. Until religious pressure and abuse is stopped, the, the teen suicide rates yeah. will not go down and not decrease. Sad stories. So it's very sad. Uh, we hope that if there's anybody watching who wants to get away from abuse, give us a call. We'll help you. And we will help you with the love that God gives us to help you. And, and uh, thank you, Earl. Yeah, thank you, you know, God does care for children. He has many cautions in his Bible about how parents are to treat their children. Colossians 3.21 says, Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. The Bible doesn't say abuse them or discipline them until they're terrorized. The Bible prohibits sexual abuse of children, and if done by their fathers, it is especially wicked. Don't these polygamous men realize that God is watching their every act of physical and sexual abuse against the innocent children who cannot defend themselves? We pray that the leaders of the polygamy groups will recognize that judgment of God is promised to be leveled against all who hurt the children. Jesus said, let the children come unto me, so let them. We want to thank you for watching, and God bless. Yeah.